All right, let's get started with our second panel uh, today, which is um, entitled Escaping Enslavement by Sea and from the Coastal South. And we've got several panelists, uh, all of whom um, have either contributed to the book or are very well positioned to say something, um, to make observations about the work that's been done and the new scholarship that's been done. So let me introduce the, um, the panel and then our, um, our commentator as well. Um, our first speaker today is Michael Thompson. Uh, Dr. Michael Thompson is uh, the uh, uh, UC Foundation Associate Professor of History at the University of Tennessee, Chattanooga. And he is the author of Working on the Dock of the Bay, heard that somewhere before, Labor and Enterprise in an Antebellum Southern Port, published by the University of South Carolina Press in 2015. Uh, he contributed chapter two to our Sailing to Freedom volume, Working on the Docks, Waterfront Labor, Coastal Commerce, and Escaping Enslavement from Charleston, South Carolina. So he'll be leading off. Our second speaker is Cassandra Newby Alexander. Uh, Dr. Cassandra Newby Alexander is the Endowed Professor of Virginia Black History and Culture uh, and the Director of the Joseph Jenkins Robert Center for the Study of the African Diaspora and the former Dean of the College of Liberal, Liberal Arts at Norfolk State University in Virginia. She's the author of Virginia Waterways and the Underground Railroad, which was published in Mount Pleasant, South Carolina by the History Press in 2017. She also contributed chapter four to our volume, which is entitled Hampton Roads and Norfolk, Virginia as a waypoint and gateway for the enslaved persons, sorry, for enslaved persons seeking freedom. And our final speaker uh, on the panel is uh, Megan Jeffries, uh, who is a doctoral candidate in the history department at Cornell University. Uh, she was a project moderator, continues to be a collaborating researcher for the Freedom on the Move project. Uh, a, uh, which is fully entitled Freedom on the Move Runaway Slave Advertisement Database. Her research focuses on self-liberation and fugitivity in Northern Virginia, using runaway slave advertisements to understand the lives and experiences of enslaved individuals. She contributed chapter 10, which is sort of the capstone chapter about research um, and new research possibilities using digital media. Uh, her chapter is entitled Freedom on the Move by Sea, Evidence of Maritime Escape Strategies in American Runaway Slave Advertisements. And then as a commentator, uh, we have invited from coming down from Maine, Dr. Michael Schopner. Uh, Dr. Schopner is the Associate Professor of History and the Coordinator of the Pre-Law Program at the University of Maine, Farmington. His expertise is on American legal history and the history of race. His first book, Moral Contagion, Black Atlantic Sailors, Citizenship, and Diplomacy in Antebellum America was published in 2019 with Cambridge University Press. One of his current projects is a case study of the Supreme Court's infamous Dred Scott decision. And I'll say Dr. Schopner's uh, work came to my attention because he had done uh, historic research on the laws enacted in southern ports and southern municipalities to control free black sailors and enslaved black uh, sailors uh, prior to the Civil War. So I'm really looking forward to what they all have to say, and I will invite um, uh, Michael Thompson to take the podium. Thank you. Well, I, I, good afternoon. I want to thank Tim, I want to thank Lee, and everyone who was involved in putting together the edited volume, um, the, the conference, and the amazing exhibit that I had a chance to look at uh, before, this, before this panel. Uh, but I want to thank uh, all of the scholars who, who are here today and sharing their work, and all the public historians who are here, and, and the audience, uh, the students especially. Hopefully uh, some of them will, will make their way back here for the afternoon. Um, I'm going to be taking us to Charleston, South Carolina. Uh, in many ways, I'm going to be picking up from where we left off at the end of the morning session and starting to answer some of the questions uh, and topics that came up in the room right before the break. But I also suspect that some of the, um, some of the, the, the issues that I have to share will raise new questions. Um, so taking us to, to Charleston um, in 1862. In 1862, a former South Carolina slave named John Andrew Jackson 
published an account of his enslavement and escape from bondage during the winter of 1846 and 1847. In his narrative, Jackson claimed to have become aware of the geographical limits of slavery from northern travelers passing through rural South Carolina. The Yankees, or northerners, when they visited our plantations, the former slave explained, quote, used to tell the Negroes that there was a place, that there was a country called England, where there were, were no slaves, and that the city of Boston was free, and that we used to wish we knew which way to travel to find those places, end quote. Jackson often had been tasked with driving his master's cattle to market in Charleston, located approximately 150 miles away. And it occurred to Jackson that, quote, if I could hide in one of the vessels I saw ladding at the wharves, I should be able to get to the free country, wherever that was. During a three-day Christmas holiday in 1846, Jackson slipped away from the festivities of the slave quarters and made his way to Charleston on a pony. And there's the, the front image of, of Jackson's account from 1862, and he, of course, is escaping on the pony here to Charleston. Recalling that it was the custom in the city for masters to hire out their bondsmen, he joined a gang of slave wharf hands on the docks, and despite lacking a mandatory slave badge used to visibly identify and regulate the city's enslaved workers, it earned wages without arousing any suspicion. After laboring on the docks for several weeks, Jackson boarded a ship and inquired of the free black cook whether the vessel was bound for Boston. After the cook affirmed that it was, the runaway asked, can't you stow me away? The free black seaman immediately said that he could, but having second thoughts, he asked Jackson, did not some white man send you here to ask me this? The cook elucidated that under the provisions of South Carolina's controversial Negro Seaman Acts, passed between 18, 1822 and 1856, and designed to prevent seditious communications between Southern slaves and Northern or foreign free blacks, the black members of the crew had been in jail since the vessel's arrival, but that in preparation for departure, the captain had paid to release them from confinement the day before. Despite his misgivings, the free black cook agreed to look for a place to hide Jackson, but beseeched the fugitive not to betray him. When Jackson returned to the vessel the next morning, the cook again expressed apprehension and told the slave to go ashore and that he wanted nothing to do with him. Jackson obeyed, but snuck on board after the cook entered the ship's galley. Tiptoeing to the cargo hatch, the runaway waited there for the captain or mate to emerge from the cabin. When the mate appeared, Jackson asked permission to remove the hatch and, quote, he thinking that I was one of the gang coming to work there, told me that I might. Jackson descended and soon was joined in the hold by a gang of slave laborers who began questioning him about his occupation and owner. Just then, they were all ordered on deck, and, and as soon as I was left, he recalled, I slipped my, myself between two bales of cotton, with the deck above me in a space not large enough for a bale of cotton to go. And just then, a bale was placed at the mouth of my crevice and shut me in a space about four foot by three foot, or thereabouts. I then heard them gradually filling up the hold, and at last, the hatch was placed on, and I was left in total darkness. Cramped, dehydrated, and nearly asphyxiated, conditions not unlike those experienced by millions of enslaved Africans during the Atlantic crossing. John Andrew Jackson was forced to reveal himself en route to Boston. The white captain, like the free black cook, was convinced that he was being entrapped and that a white Charlestonian had ordered Jackson to stow away in the vessel. The captain therefore resolved to return the runaway aboard the first southward ship encountered, but he met no such vessel. On the evening of February 10, 1847, the ship, with the stowaway, docked in Boston, and Jackson obtained his freedom. As evidenced by Jackson's account, laboring on an urban waterfront had its advantages, even for the enslaved. The antebellum South's bustling wharves and levees offered slaves more than, more than the capacity to hire one's own time, earn wages, and claim a measure of autonomy. Situated on the western rim of the Atlantic world in what might be characterized as an amphibious or literal borderland, slaves toiling along Charleston seaboard also were afforded ample occasion to interact with northern and foreign mariners, receive abolitionist literature, stow away in dockside vessels, and abscond to northern ports via the Underground Railroad. These labor and life experiences were in many ways unique. 
Due to the nature of their indispensable work, enslaved dock laborers in this coastal port were daily subject to outside influences and presented with remarkable opportunities and entice enticements, not accessible to most plantation slaves or even other urban bondsmen not employed along the water's edge. Not even the slaves of New Orleans' crowded levees or those manning the hundreds of steamboats plying the Mississippi quite enjoyed all of the potential and inherent benefits of perpetual exposure and access to ocean-going vessels of the nearby Atlantic and their black and white crews. Consequent legislation, such as South Carolina's Negro Seamen Acts, aimed to further control the communication and movements of the city's bondsmen. But as with measures, measures censuring work songs and, and prescribing slave badges, hiring locations, and fixed wages, enslaved workers were not so easily dominated by authorities and masters and found ways to resist and circumvent such restrictions. Long before enslaved waterman Robert Smalls famously drew on his experience, knowledge, and skills as a stevedore, rigger, and pilot to boldly guide the Confederate steam-powered gunboat Planter out of Charleston Harbor and into Civil War immortality, scores of unheralded slaves employed waterfront labor to embark on maritime conveyances of the Underground Railroad and so find their way to freedom. With hundreds, then thousands of vessels annually entering and exiting Charleston Harbor, runaway slaves were drawn to the city's waterfront. In fact, countless bondsmen had escaped enslavement by stowing away in northward vessels during the colonial period, and maritime runaways continued their flight during and after the American Revolution. In a runaway advertisement published in August 1781, William Sams announced that his slave Will, quote, had been seen about the wharves in town. James Lina similarly informed readers in May 1784 that his guy, that his man, Guy, quote, has been frequently seen about Rose's Wharf. Some slave owners plainly stated their fears. Among them was William McWayne, who, whose, quote, stout made Negro lad named Sam was supposed to be lurking about until he gets an opportunity of going on board some vessel. A master named G. Hooper likewise assumed that his slave Jupiter would endeavor to get away by sea. Slave masters were so concerned that their absconded slaves would stow away and sail to freedom, hundreds of runaway advertisements issued warnings to ship captains who frequented South Carolina ports. A typical notice read, quote, masters of vessels are hereby cautioned against suffering such a slave to be harbored by their crews, concealed on shipboard, or carried off. Nevertheless, Hundreds of slaves continued to run away during the early to mid 19th century, using maritime strategies that constituted an important but little understood dimension of the Underground Railroad. Leaders of the South Carolina Association, a group of prominent white Charlestonians formed after the Denmark Vesey conspiracy to maintain order and implement stricter controls over the city's black population, warned the state legislature in the early 1820s that there were increasing attempts to inveigle away our slaves. So many packet ship lines now existed between Charleston and New York, not to mention other northern ports, that, quote, the opportunities for embarking are occurring almost every day in the year. And consequently, there was no security that our slaves will not be seduced from the service of their masters in greater numbers than heretofore. The historical record demonstrates, however, that most runaway slaves were not, in fact, unwillingly inveigled or seduced from bondage. What's more, rather than merely loitering about the wharves and awaiting a chance occasion to slip aboard, to slip into a ship's hold, many runaway, runaway slaves actively sought waterfront work that presented these opportunities for embarking, especially when loading cotton or rice below decks. Waterfront work, waterfront employment, in other words, was an ideal halfway house on a runaway's road to freedom. In an account similar to that of John Andrew Jackson's escape from bondage, the New York abolitionist newspaper, The Emancipator, chronicled the firsthand narrative of another slave's flight from Charleston's waterfront during the winter of 1837. This unnamed bondsman detailed the beatings and abuse he had received while working for a railroad company in rural South Carolina. The day after a particularly severe whipping, he slipped away into some nearby woods. That night, under the cover of darkness, the slave returned to the railroad, boarded a car, and hid among cotton bales bound for Charleston. After arriving in the city, the runaway made his way to the waterfront 
and though lacking the requisite slave badge, waited there with the rest of the hands to get work. Long before, before long, a white stevedore approached and offered the fugitive a job, and he followed the employer to a wharf where he worked alongside other slaves, stowing away cotton in a vessel from Boston. Each day, the enslaved wharf hands went to a cook shop for meals. But lacking money, the runaway returned to the vessel where he became acquainted with the white steward who gave the slave something to eat. When asked one day, how much of your wages do you have to give to your master? The slave answered all, to which the steward responded that it was not so where he came from and that there the people all are free. Apparently having never heard of black freedom, the former slave recalled, quote, when he told me this, I began to think there was a free country and to wish that I could get there. During subsequent conversations, the steward proposed assisting the slave to run away to the north. Quote, he said the vessel was all loaded and would sail next morning. The day was Saturday, and he told me that after I had knocked off work and got my pay, I must stay there and stay there until it was dark and all the people in the ship were asleep, and that he would wait for me. He said he had got a place made to hide me in, and that if I was sure enough not to cough or make any noise, he thought he could get me away safe. End quote. After dark, the fugitive crept along the wharf to the vessel where he was greeted by the white steward, who hastily opened the scuttle and instructed the slave to quietly jump in. Once the hatchway was closed, the stowaway crowded in between the bales. After a harrowing four-week voyage to Boston, the steward assisted the runaway out of his hiding place and directed him to walk up the street and inquire for a black boarding house. The newly freed slave soon encountered a black man who quickly perceived from his dress and the cotton in his hair, in his hair and his, on his clothes, that he was a runaway, and saw to it that he was cared for. Waterfront labor also facilitated the escape of Ben Elliott, who absconded from his owner, A.J. Huntington, of Augusta, Georgia, in October 1834. In advertisements continuously appearing in the Charleston Courier between February 4th and April 9th, 1835, Huntington expressed concern that Ben had returned to Charleston, the city in which the slave was raised and where his mother still sold fruit in the market. Prior to being sold to Huntington 18 months before, and despite being rather dandyish, Ben was in the habit of working about the wharves on board vessels as a stevedore or an assistant. Although Huntington's slave disappeared into the relative anonymity and liminality of Charleston's waterfront, and the master advertised for capture and return in a Charleston newspaper, his runaway ad paradoxically reemerged in the Emancipator in 1836. After 19 months of searching for his valuable bondsman, A.J. Huntington reasonably concluded that Ben was no longer in South Carolina and likely had exploited his employment and familiarity on Charleston's docks to stow away to freedom in New York City. Evidence suggests that New York and Boston, the latter being the cradle of American the American anti-slavery movement and home to prominent abolitionists such as David Walker and William Lloyd Garrison, were the preferred destinations of Charleston's maritime runaways. But many slaves were not successful in their attempts to run away via Charleston's waterfront, wherever the destination. Warfinger Thomas Marshall, for instance, reported that one of his slaves who, quote, writes well enough and has the capacity to write his free papers, passes, etc., was confined in the workhouse after attempting to take his departure for the North by engaging with, quote, the Yankee captain of a, of a, fishing, a fishing smack. In June 1837, two slaves owned by lawyer and legislator Langton, Langston Cheeves were discovered at, on, at sea aboard the brig New York and transported back to Charleston on a pilot boat. Under the title, Another, Another Attempt at Escape, the Savannah Georgian reported in May 1845 that a slave named James, the property of Charleston's mercantile firm, Williams and McBarney, was, quote unquote, fortunately discovered, hiding between a water cask and a cotton bale aboard a British bark anchored off Long Island, New York, and bound for Liverpool, England. This English seaport also was the intended destination for a fugitive named Billy, whom Charleston City Guard officer Moses Levy found concealed in the longboat of the British ship Coronet, prepared to make his escape. A year earlier, the same slave had nearly stolen out of Charleston Harbor before he was discovered and returned to town, conceding that, quote, the city of Charleston rendered it comparatively easy for the said slave to accomplish his purpose to abscond in some future attempt. 
Billy's master resolved to sell the unruly but valuable bondsmen. Following the Confederate firing on Fort Sumter located in Charleston Harbor in, 18, in April of 1861, the Civil War engulfed the city's Cooper River waterfront and ultimately rendered the matter of stowaway slaves moot. But with Union forces occupying much of the South Carolina and Georgia coast by late 1861, and with the Union naval blockade located just miles from Charleston's wharves, bondsmen, included, including the aforementioned Robert Smalls, continued until emancipation to seek freedom via the distinctive maritime conduit that formed a key component of the Underground Railroad. Thank you. I would like to thank Tim and Lee for this wonderful invitation to talk with you all about my favorite subject. You know, a lot of the history that I've done on the Underground Railroad has really been about reparative justice, making people who have been invisible in our histories visible again and helping to try to restore that humanity that our society has continued to strip from them, which is why I always include the names and the histories of individuals who risk everything, including their families, to find freedom. And yet, even when they separated from their families, they spent the rest of their lives trying to reestablish that family connection. For some people, it never happened. For others, it did. And some of them found safety and sanctuary in places like New Bedford and Boston and Lynn, Massachusetts, or in the Chester County area of, of Pennsylvania, or up in upstate New York or in Montreal, as did Shadrach Minkins, or in the Ontario province, especially in Toronto, but also in those other areas like St. Catharines and Elgin and other, Buxton and some of those other smaller spaces. And so I, the, the history that I have tried to um, really focus on really um, looks at how these people escaped, why they escaped, but more importantly, who were these people? What did they leave behind? What did they try to reconnect with? And what kind of lives did they try to create for themselves and for their families? And sometimes it is heartbreaking. I want to begin, even though I didn't include but a mention of this in my, in my um, uh, contribution, my chapter, I stumbled on a story about a man named uh, Sheridan Ford. His original name, his real name, was Robert Irvin. And I stumbled on a case. You know, historians, we spend most of our time stumbling, stumbling on this record, stumbling on that. And it opens a door for so many important details that fill in a story. And for Robert Irving, I stumbled on a lawsuit that was um, uh, put in place by his son from his first marriage that was not seen as legal by the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, even though Virginia had declared all slave marriages as legal. And what this meant was that his heirs from his first marriage, according to Massachusetts, had no rights as heirs. And so even though Massachusetts thought they were doing a great job in not recognizing slavery, for so many who were enslaved, it harmed them. It harmed them in the aftermath at the end of enslavement. And for this family, it did, but for historians, it gave me depositions from his first wife, his son, his sister, his brother-in-law, and the two friends who helped him escape. And I learned 
about this man's life. I learned where he worked. I learned that he was working with his father at the Naval Hospital in Portsmouth. I learned that they, he and his wife were seen as prominent among African Americans, both free and enslaved, in the little city of Portsmouth, which was at that time in the 1850s, two square miles. So everybody knew everyone's business. And that's why it was very difficult to escape without people learning. And when he heard that his owner was about to sell him and he ran away and tried to get to his family, his wife's owner took him, took her, took the children and his wife and put them in the slave jail in Norfolk. And he tried for months to get them out and couldn't. And eventually gave up because he was fearing he would uh, be captured and he fled first, of course, through William Still Station and then eventually to New Bedford. Um, and what was interesting about his situation is he tried for years, but finally by 1863, and he escaped in 1855. By 1863, he had given up and married another person who was living in New Bedford because there was a whole community of people from my area of Portsmouth, Norfolk, Princess Anne County, that whole region, what they call Virginia Beach today, Chesapeake, that whole area. And he married a woman who went to the same church that he did in Portsmouth. Two years later, he got a letter from one of the friends who helped him escape saying, your wife and children have returned to Portsmouth. So he was already married again, and so was she, because selling someone away was like death. And you probably would never see your spouse, and if you were sold from your children, your children again. But the children visited him twice. He had made such a wonderful life for himself. He owned two houses, he even owned a piano, gave each and every one of his five children a solid gold watch, and had $1,200 in the bank when he died in 1895. That's how well he did. But he returned to Portsmouth two years before he died, and he looked at his son, who was the third oldest, excuse me, third uh, of his ch first three children, and he looked at him and he said, son, I can't come here anymore. It's too painful. When I look at you, and I look at my wife, and he was talking about his first wife, so fortunately his second wife was not there when he said that. Um, he said, when I look at you and I look at my wife, I can't do it anymore. And then he turned to his first wife and he said, had I not been forced to escape this year, we would have celebrated our 50th wedding anniversary. Those stories are human. They're painful. They resonate even today. One of the people who's living in the house where Sheridan Ford lived with his first wife, Julia, um, tracked down the descendants of the son who filed a lawsuit when his um, half-siblings refused to give him uh, part of the inheritance. And she found over 500 of this man, Frank's descendants, and they came and visited where their ancestors were kept as enslaved people. And they had an opportunity to worship in the church where their ancestors worshiped and walk the grounds of their ancestors. And they cried. And they celebrated a history that their families never told them because of the pain because they did not want to generationally pass down that trauma, even though they did. Those are the stories that break my heart, but also cause me to sing, because now their stories are taking root in the hearts and minds of other people. And the one thing we can do to help the pain and the trauma is to remember, to remember and to celebrate the sacrifices. There's another man 
And I'm still working on tracking his legacy down. This man's name was John Atkinson. Now, I love the way that John Atkinson described his owner, and you can't make this stuff up. He called this man a worthless sot. And that's about as bad of a name as you can give anybody. In the 19th century, that's like using every four-letter word you, to describe a person. His owner worked in the Gosper Navy Shipyard, which is today the Norfolk Naval Shipyard in Portsmouth. It's where the first battleship for the nation was constructed, and the, um, uh, the stone yard that they used to construct it was built by enslaved laborers. In fact, in Norfolk, Norfolk is a paradox, or the Norfolk region is a paradox, because William Still said that it was the southern depot of the Underground Railroad. But we also have found out that Norfolk had, was also a huge departure point on the domestic slave trade. And that may have been part of the element fueling those going into uh, the Underground Railroad, although it was because of the waterways, because of the maritime industry, because so many free and enslaved people worked the aboard ferries, they were omnibus drivers, they, they worked the docks, they worked, um, they were in many cases the only ferrymen, they were the navigators, they were everywhere. And here you have white southerners who were trying to stop this group of people who knew the landscape better than most of the whites in the region, and they were trying to stop them from getting aboard ships. What do you think happened? They had a hard time stopping them. That's why even the Commonwealth of Virginia um, tried to incentivize by offering huge awards, thousands of dollars of awards. That didn't do a thing, I, I might add. Um, but this man, John Atkinson, who was 31 years old when he escaped, um, was about to be sold away. And that was one of the key motivators that if you're about to be sold, you want to escape before you lose control of your life and you're part of that 24% of all the ships that arrived in the New Orleans slave market, that you would be one of those um, statistics. And so he did escape. But interestingly, he's a great model of how many escaped from the Norfolk Harbor. So many people coming from Eastern North Carolina or from um, what we call Suffolk today, which was Nasman County, or coming from Hampton, or Newport News, what we call Warwick County at that time, or Elizabeth City County, or even as far away as Williamsburg, or the Eastern Shore, or through the Dismal Swamp. Most of them came to the Norfolk Harbor because on average, 1,500 ships were coming and going, coming and going, all the time, it would take two to three days, usually tops, to get from Norfolk to Philadelphia. A little bit longer to get to Boston or New Bedford. Not much longer, though. And so this man was assisted by Shadrach, excuse me, not Shadrach, John Minkins, not, no relation to Shadrach Minkins, who was a free black in Norfolk. He was a steward aboard the city of Richmond, but also the, the Augusta. He eventually owned his own schooner by 1860. This young man worked with all the different conductors in Norfolk, including Sam Nixon, who adopted the alias Thomas Bain, who lived right here in New Bedford, Massachusetts, and he completed his dental training uh, right here. And then when he returned to Norfolk, he entered politics. Uh, the sad story about him is that he was such a political firebrand that eventually his opponents got him labeled as insane and threw him into the Petersburg Insane Asylum, which was designed basically to kill a lot of African Americans. Um, but we also had a man by the name of Bluebeard. His name was Henry Louis. And he had a very interesting and, and controversial history. He was married uh, to a woman named Rebecca Jones. And he's the one who helped Shadrach Minkins escape. 
and ended up in Boston. He left his wife and three children behind. He corresponded with her for a little while and then suddenly stopped talking to her. And about six years later, she escaped. Same people helped her escape, not Henry Louis, of course, but some other people helped her escape. A man by the name of, they called him Dr. Henry or Harry Lundy, who was a member of St. Patrick's Church, a Catholic church that has a very interesting history that we're looking at right now. When she escaped and she had a tremendous hardship, um, she was supposed to have been freed. Her owner left a will saying she should be free, but unfortunately somebody mysteriously lost the will and then tried to sell her. And I love what she said. She said, I would rather die than remain a slave. And she also said not three cents when she was offered to have a friend buy her freedom. She said not a three cent would I give, nor do I want any of my friends to buy me, not if they could get me for three cents. I would rather die. She sounds like she was a descendant of the Dahomey women. Um, but in but she was someone who ended up going to Boston, but she refused to see her husband. Now, I can only think of one reason why she would refuse to talk with him. And she died, decided to leave and go to California, and that's where she spent the rest of her life, refusing ever to have anything to do with this man who was one of the most dexterous conductors on the Underground Railroad in our region. All of those individuals were tied in with John Atkinson. Now, I wanted to show you this map because it's a really great way to see our region. You see how large the Chesapeake Bay is. But let me tell you, these rivers, it is difficult to see across some of these rivers because they're so vast. And so if you can imagine on this huge map, you're seeing all these smaller ones. Our creeks look like rivers, and our rivers look like bays, and our bays look like oceans. The waterways are vast and intricate, and because we are in what is called a tidewater area, all the rivers run into the bay, which runs into the ocean. There's no difference. It's very easy to maneuver from one location to the other, and this is, of course, the area, Hampton Roads. Down here is the Dismal Swamp, which is today only about one-eighth of the size it originally was. That's my little timer telling me to shut up. I wanted to show you just a few statistics. Uh, William Still, I love him. I'll love him till the day I die because he was the pack rat of all pack rats. He made sure that nothing was destroyed, unlike most of the other white abolitionists who destroyed their records at the end of the Civil War. He not only kept his records, buried them during the Civil War, but made sure they were, some of them were published in a book so that families could reconnect. And these statistics that you see are just, to, for me, just a few examples of how many people escaped. This is a drop in the bucket because when Atkinson wrote, and, and if you notice, these people are literate. But it's not surprising in Norfolk, because Norfolk actually tried to force the Postmaster General to stop delivering abolitionist newspapers to their enslaved population. So enslaved people had enough money to buy a subscription to an abolitionist newspaper, and the government actually delivered those newspapers to them as enslaved people. Um, this famous picture that Timothy showed you earlier is if you come to Norfolk at what we call Waterside. This is the Roanoke Dock at Waterside. And this, so there's a marker there where this actual event occurred. And what it really shows you is this man is the mayor of Norfolk, how important it was to try to stop enslaved people. And aboard this ship, he had at least 20 people hidden aboard his vessel. And the reason that he was so successful is because people paid him money. And many of the people who hired out their time 
were able to give him money for passage, but those others who were not so fortunate stole the money because they figured they deserved that money anyway, and they, made, they stole the money and managed to get aboard these ships. And he took hundreds of people into the north. This is an example of one of the steamships. So John Minkins, who worked aboard these steamships, he would have what he call a little compartment. It was usually a tiny little space above the boiler room. And if you can imagine for two days, you're in a tiny space above the boiler room. I can see why on a steamship, the captain may not know you're there. But on a schooner, they all knew that people were there. I wanted to end with this. I highlighted some names because I, I mentioned already Dr. Lundy and Henry Louis because John Atkinson wrote this letter to William Still telling him this fabulous story and telling him also that he was with family and friends and his brother was there in St. Catharines, the home of Harriet Tubman along with family and friends, and he wanted to make sure he tried to bring his wife with to, to where he was located. Whether or not he was he's successful, I guess I'll finish that story when I finish the research. Thank you all so very much. <laughs> I'll just grab it out. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Good afternoon. Um, <laughs> some people are still awake. Um, I actually wasn't expecting anybody to say anything back, so that shocked me a little bit. <laughs> a way to wake me up as well in that post-lunch fog. Um, so all the stories that we've heard since lunch have been extremely interesting and astounding. So thank you guys for making it so easy to pay attention. Um, thank you to everybody, all the individuals, the organizations, and the groups that have put this together. I don't know about any of you, but this is my first conference in person since the pandemic. So it's really nice to see faces in an audience and not just be looking at a Zoom screen. And for those of you on Zoom, hello. <laughs> um, <laughs> sorry that you couldn't make it to be here in person. I know the physical space of being here in a place that we're talking about the history of is just, it's amazing. Um, so we're going to switch gears a little bit from these fascinating stories and this conclusive or somewhat conclusive at least research and switch gears to talk about the world of digital databases. <laughs> um, uh, everyone's kind of rolling their eyes a little bit. But digital humanities, you guys, it's coming up. Um, so real quick, before I kind of dive into what I talk about in my chapter and what my continued research kind of looks at, I want to talk to you about a database called Freedom on the Move. So for those of you who aren't familiar with this database. The database is actually meant to create an, a conglomeration of a bunch of runaway slave advertisements from various places around the United States and house them in one database. Um, for those of you who have done some research through runaway slave advertisements, having multiple regions in one space is extraordinarily new. Um, and I'll get to some numbers on kind of what we're looking at the database right now and how far it's come since I wrote this chapter. Um, but to let you guys know, this project actually began, it was a kind of a brainchild of multiple people, um, and it's one of those beautiful things that happen when historians can work together to create something. So we have somebody who works with me up in Cornell, as well as a couple of people who work in Alabama and New Orleans that have brought together all of their resources from their research, for the work that they've had their students help them with, to create this astounding database that is continuing to evolve and grow. Um, one of the unique features about this database, though, isn't just that it houses runaway advertisements. It's that it offers everybody from professors and students and amateur historians, I don't like that term, but amateur historians and everybody else who just wants to be a part of the history to take part in the research process. Um, so there's what we call in our group the crowdsourcing application. Um, and essentially what it does is it allows you to go into a particular advertisement, one you choose or just one that's assigned at random, and pull out information that is in that advertisement. 
a lot of the people that have worked with runaway advertisements on this panel and the panels before and the panels to come know what them is. You're pulling out the information about names, dates, um, locations, all of these kinds of things, and you're being a part of that process. Now, once numerous people have done the crowdsourcing um, process for one advertisement, it goes to a moderator, who I used to be, um, and then gets added into a searchable database that you can use and you can search for particular terms, you can search for locations, you can search for names. Um, it makes it a researcher's dream, to be honest with you. Um, and because it has to go through the crowdsourcing application so many times, it helps to vet some of those mistakes that happen often with transcription. Beyond that, we also work with the Hard History Project to help create a lot of educational resources and tools. So for those of you who are teachers or who just want to like learn how to talk about some of these subjects, it offers a lot of videos and ways of kind of broaching the subject with a variety of age groups. So from younger children in middle school, let's say, all the way up through those of us in grad school. Um, and so it helps you break that through. So. The entire purpose of the database, though, is to talk about runaway slave advertisements. Um, I know earlier today, Tim, you said that maritime commerce was the lifeblood of the economy. Um, if that was the lifeblood of the economy, this was the social media um, of the, the time. This was where you expo you know, discuss things like you do on Twitter or on Instagram. This is where everything was. You'd have heated debates. You'd have gossip. You'd have advertisements for lost property, lost things, lost money. Who knew people returned it? Um, <laughs> and in a lot of instances, buried among all of the news of the day and all of these advertisements, you'd see advertisements like numerous ones that you've seen today. Um, the one up on the screen is an example, and it's one that I use in my chapter, um, of a particular individual who's escaped from Charleston, South Carolina. And this is published on the 20th of June in 1836. Um, just to give you a little background. So in my chapter and kind of some of the things that I work off when I'm talking to other people about what the importance is of runaway advertisements, there's so many different parts of them. Um, I tried to break it down to kind of some of the most basic elements. The first thing that you're going to always notice is that it's going to have a subject. It's going to be about something, someone that they're trying to recover. Um, in some cases, it has a name. In other cases, it doesn't have a name. Um, in this case, it's a fellow named Ned. Um, but it's always going to point you to the thing that they're wanting to recover. Uh, second, we have the physical description. Now, again, this ranges. This can be something from as simple as a one-word description to something that goes into depth about how someone obtained particular scars on particular situations. Um, in this case, the description of Ned is, I'd say, kind of in the middle of those two. It's describing a little bit about what he looks like, about his color, um, distinguishing characteristics as well. He has an issue when he's walking. Um, and that's one of those things that you're going to want to, like the enslavers would include, to try to get that lost property back. Now, there's also going to be the subscriber. This isn't always going to be the enslaver. It's sometimes somebody that works with them. Sometimes it's somebody who's hired the enslaved individual for, to work for them. Um, in other cases, it's friends of the people who are enslaved with. Um, but there's always going to be somebody who's put the advertisement into the newspaper. Um, we also have location. Um, location comes in many different shapes and sizes in runaway advertisements. It can be from something as in-depth in this case. We have Ned, who's the last time he was seen, he was in a sloop leaving from South Bay, which gives an, kind of a direction on the potential method of his escape, um, that he escaped in a sloop. It also can have intended destination. Again, in this advertisement, it talks about, I believe it's pronounced Adista Bay. I'm not from South Carolina. I'm so sorry. Um, <laughs> but that's where his wife is. And so it's expected that he may turn up in that general location. Um, in other cases, it doesn't talk at all in the advertisement about the location. It actually says you get some glean of where it may have happened, where the escape may have happened, where the enslaver is located by the publication of the advertisement and where it's being published. It's not always, though, that it's being published in a newspaper that's near where the person escaped. Sometimes it's where they expect them to be heading to. Um, in this case, it was published in the Charleston Mercury, so it is in the location from which he attempted to escape. But there's something that to kind of glean from that. And finally, there's an, 
a reward. There's an enticement. There's an incentive to the people who are reading the advertisement. It can range from a cent to hundreds of dollars, depending on the individuals, the subscriber, if it's a group, um, it kind of all varies. But what these elements do is they not only tell you about the advertisement and about the particular person that is writing it, as well as the person that they're trying to recover, it also gives you methods of how to potentially track down other sources to substantiate the information that's here or to debunk some of the information that's here. Um, sources have their issues. We all know that. I know we've heard it before a little bit earlier in the first panel about some of the issues with newspapers, right? Um, it's the same thing. It gives you a path to kind of look for numerous other sources to be able to understand who this individual was, where they're escaping, and anything else that we can get. It's pretty astounding what one singular advertisement can do, honestly. Um, beyond that, though, and moving back from that singular advertisement, you can look at groups of advertisements and understand trends that are happening. You've heard that a lot today. I mean, for the chapter that I looked at, I looked at all of the advertisements that were in the Freedom on the Move database at the time that I wrote this chapter. <laughs> um, and we'll talk a little bit about numbers in a second. Um, from the advertisements that were transcribed out at the time, which was 4,312, a number I've committed to memory now, <laughs> um, there were 617 advertisements that had words that pertain to maritime escape. I searched through different terms for different ships and different boats and different ports um, and different warnings and the word vessel and all different variations of all of these things came up with 617 advertisements, which is about 14% of the total that was transcribed. Now, one of the first trends I found was about 147 of those 617 had instances where it was escape from a vessel. And, and I just want to point out that none of these advertisements, the enslaved individuals who escaped, were never referred to as cargo. Um, they were always employed on the vessels, which I find entertaining, like not entertaining, interesting. You'll notice on the map that most of these are happening along the Atlantic seaboard. We do have a little bubble that's popping up here in New Orleans, and a lot of that is part of the contributions of the advertisements as well as the popularity of the port. Um, when I did this paper and um, submitted it, there the advertisements that were in the runaway, like the Freedom on the Move database, were ne weren't necessarily they don't represent the entire geography. <laughs> we'll put it that way. <laughs> The second trend is escape with the use of a vessel or escape via vessel. These are people that they're intended, they or they're expected to utilize the escapes like Ned using a sloop or some other form of vessel to get away. Um, of these, there's about 205 of the advertisements that did this. And you'll notice that you start to see a little bit more frequency. You're gonna see different ports that these are happening in. Um, and the final trend and the most prevalent are warnings to ship captains not to harbor or assist in the escape of the individuals. Um, this has 343 advertisements, and those of you who are good at math are going to go, that doesn't add up to 617. Um, and that's because there's crossovers. Um, there is an advertisement that Tim put up there earlier about a man named Phil, who is there is an expected escape attempt with the use of a vessel, as well as a warning to ship captains not to use, not to aid him in his escape. You'll also notice, though, that while there's a majority of them that are appearing along the Atlantic seaboard, you also notice that they're appearing along major rivers and lakes. Sorry, I lost the word. Um, and this just points to the way that a database like this can be utilized to extend some of that scholarship that some of you have asked questions about earlier today, about extending that into the interior of the United States. All right. So real quick, I know I'm getting short on time, but I just want to talk to you a little bit about the Freedom on the New Move database and how much it's grown even in the time since I wrote this chapter. The numbers I found in this chapter are almost irrelevant at the moment because of how much it's grown. Um, when I wrote this chapter, there were 22,476 advertisements in the database. Now, for those of you who have used runaway slave databases before, that's actually a lot more than most of them have. So starting from a rather large group. Now, of those, only 4,312 were had gone through that crowdsourcing process and were part of the searchable database. Um, and there were 13 states represented, though most of the advertisements did come from New York and New Orleans, um, and the rest of them were kind of split in the middle. 
Now you'll see today how much that's grown. We now have other states that are included. Some of the states that were there before are now have a larger representation. We also have thousands of advertisements that haven't been uploaded into the system yet because we're currently undergoing a remodeling of the interface. Once that's complete, those will get added in. And we have more than 10,000 that have been just transcribed. And I was corrected a couple days ago after I'd already submitted this. It's actually more than 13,000 now. Um, of all of the anticipated newspaper runaway slave advertisements that the Library of Congress says there are out there, there's, they claim there's about 200,000. I would argue that there's a lot more. Um, of that, though, you'll see the representation that we have in one center database at these particular years. And we expect that to grow, not only to encompass all of the United States, but also to encompass areas beyond that as well, including the Caribbean and Europe. Um, it'd be wonderful and a magical experience to be able to have one center place where you can look up things from multiple geographies and see these things on an individual and larger basis. So if you'd like to contribute um, at all and be a part of this process, it's freedomonthemove.org. I'm happy to talk to you guys about this more um, individually um, or if you have particular questions. Um, I don't think I have a lot of time, but I just want to real quick talk about the fact that Digital databases, while I know it's scary um, because a lot of us are really kind of embedded in those ways of those old dusty archives, and I love, love those old dusty archives. The fact is, is that being able to easily access some of these things makes it possible for research not to continue turning the same drum, but it allows us to start moving forward and looking at things on a larger scale or on a smaller scale, depending on your research focus. Um, all of these different Da digital databases are growing to include a variety of geographies, a variety of focuses. Some of them are combining multiple sources to create an interlinking, almost genealogical presence in the historical world. Um, and it just uh, looks towards the future of history, really, um, and looking at the digital databases in, con like, in connection with those archival materials as well. So if you have any questions, feel free to contact me um, either by email or you're welcome to just come up to me and say hi. Um, but yeah, that's all I got. Um, my name is Michael Shepner. I'm Associate Professor of History at the University of Maine at Farmington. And my research interests are about the policing of black people in southern port cities. And I think that research expertise explains why Tim contacted me to come and speak about this particular panel. Uh, before I get started, I want to say thank you to Tim and to Lee, although I don't see her sitting here right now, uh, for convening this. I think we're in the midst of a serious recalibration of the study of the Underground Railroad, so much so that I think the verb to run away and the noun run away in some ways is misleading. What we've seen is how often these are actually stowaways or sailaways. And so I'm going to try to use that term as much as I can, and maybe I'll mix in a couple of um, uh, other neologisms as well and we'll see if they take root. Um, so today's, um, or this afternoon's uh, presenters were talking for the most part um, about departure points. Where do enslaved people who are trying to liberate themselves, where do they leave from and what does that leaving look like? Um, and as I read through these uh, three essays, and they're, they're really fantastic pieces of scholarship, and for those of you that have not read the book yet, um, they are uh, perfect examples of how to write briefly, concisely, and, and to get to the point, and still support it with a lot of evidence. And so I strongly encourage you to, to, to read them on your own. But when I was reading them, there were three things that really jumped out at me. Um, and some of these themes have been recurring since this morning. So if I sound like a broken record, bear with me, right? You can yawn, and you won't hurt my feelings. Um, but, but the first theme that sort of jumped out at me was the primacy of maritime work, right? Maritime work explained so much about sailaways, right? And, and, and part of that is because when we look at Virginia, when we look at Charleston, these two places are simultaneously hubs of regional commerce, and yet at the same time, they're also hubs of international commerce, which means you have these places in which you have rivermen and um, people on skiffs and people from plantations going down, the, say, the Cooper River or Ashley River to, to Charleston. And at the same time, you have an international merchant marine that are operating the same wharves and same docks. So you have this motley crew of people together in a small place that affords opportunities for um, 
for the building of networks, right? So maritime work, in a sense, provides the, the context for networks to develop that allow for people to escape, right? Uh, and to give you an example about what that looks like, right, um, there are people when they're enmeshed in this network that have a much easier time getting out. So I think about the first person from your essay, uh, Dr. Newby Alexander, uh, about, I think his name is Foreman, right? And, and this, this escape slave Foreman, he is trained to be a steward on a ship. And he works as a steward on a ship for a while. And he gets to know the docks, and he gets to know the ports, and he gets to know the people and the places, and then he is able to abscond, right? And then if we, if we compare that to the, the first person from Dr. Thompson's, um, um, his first vignette from his chapter, it was about Johnson, right? Jack Johnson, right? Yeah, John Jackson, thank you. Um, and, and this guy comes into Charleston Port and doesn't really know exactly what's going on. And he goes up to a sort of almost like a random black cook and says, I would like for you to help me escape. And you can see and you could hear and you can almost feel the hesitation about jumping into this because Jackson did not do the network, right? He was, he was seen as different. He was seen as a part. Now, eventually, he's able to, to abscond anyway, but the challenges are much are, are multiplied because he has not done, he hasn't done the networking, right? He hasn't done the networking. So um, the maritime world, the, the maritime networks, I think, are absolutely essential to understanding um, um, running away. People that are enmeshed in that network know very, very well the benefits of maritime escape. They know the benefits. They know how much faster you can move on a boat. They know that the surveillance mechanisms on the boat are incredibly limited. They know the legal repercussions, that if they're in international waters, they're in some ways protected. And they know, and this is something that comes up in Dr. Newby Alexander's piece, they know that if they can tap in that network and escape through the maritime version of the Underground Railroad, there's a much better chance that they can create a chain migration for loved ones, right? So they tap into that network, they're able to escape, and they're still connected to that network by which they can bring loved ones to the north. And I think your opening vignette, I think, really does justice to that, to that concept. All right. So that's topic number one, the, the importance of maritime labor. Uh, the second piece, and this is where um, sort of my research interests sort of spike and sort of I get goosebumps when I read this part, um, is the dilemma in southern port cities. And that's something we haven't really talked about too much as of yet. And, and that has to do with... with how, if this is such a huge problem for Southern slaveholders, if this is such a huge problem for city officials, if this is such a huge problem for state lawmakers, so much so that they literally publish thousands and thousands and thousands of advertisements. You have a, the South Carolina Association. These are incredibly wealthy people in Charleston, and Charleston's a rich city, right, who are coming together and literally creating a police force of themselves, right? If, if, if this problem is so immense, right? How is it that nothing substantial comes from the state government to stop it? Right? There are some half-hearted efforts, right? But ultimately, very little is actually put into place to make this actually stop. And I think part of that has to do with the, this paradox, this dilemma of a southern port city, right? A southern port city is southern, right? I mean, by definition, but, but it means that, that southern port cities rely on enslaved labor. They rely on it. They need it. Without enslaved labor, those cities don't exist, right? Southern port cities are the gateway whereby agricultural commodities produced by enslaved labor turn into cash in the marketplace, right? And the enslaved people themselves are also commodities, right, in the eyes of southern slaveholders. So um, the, the, the southernness of these port cities is built on this concept of the importance of slave labor and protecting slave property, right? And that's why we see so many of these advertisements. At the same time, they are urban areas, and these urban areas exploding during the antebellum period are predicated on capitalist exchange and the need for cheap, efficient labor. And we see immense amount of competition on the wharves and in the docks, and so, well, northern port cities too, but southern port cities as well. And so there is this desire among, amongst uh, sort of business owners on the wharves of having a, a, a robust labor market. But the problem with a robust labor market is that it comes with it anonymity. It comes with it people who you don't know and you don't see. And, and when we talked about, uh, when Dr. Thompson talked about this, this, um, uh, uh, the sail away, right, the sail away, um, he tried to, um, to, to get some, to get some work, but he didn't have the proper paperwork. And yet that didn't seem to be a problem. 
And a couple more times in this chapter, the same thing sort of happens, right? There's supposed to be laws on the books that prevent this anonymity, but the labor market demands are so immense that those laws are largely unenforced. And so this is the dilemma in southern port cities, right? There is a, on the one hand, a desire to regulate at all costs the black population to prevent runaways to the point where they start passing laws that I've researched that prohibit the entry of free black sailors from without. Some 20,000 black sailors are arrested during the antebellum period for the simple crime of entering a southern port city, right? So there's that part, but oftentimes um, southern port cities are left in a, a moment of stasis. They are, there are laws that are unenforced, or there are laws that can't get passed, or there are roadblocks to enforcement. And it's amazing to me how politically astute enslaved people are at reading this and navigating through it and exploiting it. They know that the laws aren't being enforced and when they are being enforced, right? They're sensitive to those sorts of things and they're able to, I think, um, um, make their escapes good because they understand this particular political dynamic. All right. Um, the last of the three, so that's the dilemma of southern port cities. Uh, the last thing I want to address is this issue of sources. And it's something that has gotten a lot of airtime today for good reason, because studying the Underground Railroad comes with it the use of perilous sources. And, and all historical sources are perilous. But when we're talking about the Underground Railroad, there are particular instances or, or particular facets that make it really challenging. And one of our, um, one of our audience members today mentioned that, um, that they were descendants of somebody that, that escaped via the Underground Railroad, and that story was never told. That should tell us something about the selectivity of the sources that we do have, right? And I think we have some of that with some of the sources that are used here. I mean, to some degree, we don't have a choice. We have to use the sources that we have. It's, it's that or do nothing, and, and do nothing is not an acceptable response, right? But for instance, Dr. Newby Alexander makes wonderful work of William Still's papers, right? Wonderful work of William Still's papers. But the conductor's papers are largely about successful escapes. Not all of them, but most of them. And the escape narratives that Dr. Thompson uses so well in his chapter are also slanted towards successful escapes, right? And I think one of the great potential uses of the Freedom on the Move database is the ability to try to fill in these sources that slant towards successful escapes with those that are not successful, right? Because I'm betting that there are a lot of people who attempt, and because they don't have the networks or they don't have the connections, or because they're unlucky, or because there just happens to be a patrolman there at the time when the moment is to come where you actually make that jump, they get caught. And we, I think we need to know a lot more about that part of the story. And I think, and, and, and I'm gonna get to my questions in just one second, I think if the, if the Freedom on the Move database is able to use not just slave advertisements, but slave recapture uh, announcements, I think that would be really helpful in trying to analyze more fully this, this moment of departure, right? Um, so, I'm going to finish up with a couple of questions. Um, I think the, 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 the best part of these sessions are the Q&A. So feel free to ignore my questions and pay attention to the, the, usually the, the better questions from the, from the audience. Um, but my, my, I have three questions, right? And they're about the three different parts of, of my sort of observations. So, so first, in terms of the maritime workforce, in terms of the maritime workforce, um, This has been a largely national tale, right? We've been talking about New Bedford, we've been talking about New York and Boston, and we're gonna talk more about them this afternoon. But I wonder if this maritime network does go in more than one direction. And I think this is something that came out in the keynote address as well, something that we really need to explore. These maritime workforces are international, right? We saw one of the slave advertisements that talked about one of the sailors barely speaking English, right? There's obviously something going on here. So, so maybe the Freedom on the Move database can help with this. I'm not sure. But I think when we start looking and thinking more capaciously about the Underground Railroad, we'll maybe shy away from a strictly national tale and follow those networks wherever they might lead. And I have a feeling, and I, I hope that, that, that you might speak to this, that there are sources that you've already consulted that shows the Underground Railroad having termina in places like the Bahamas in places like Jamaica, in places like uh, Haiti, in places like Mexico. And, and I think that deserves to be part of the Underground Railroad um, story as well. So do you have anything to say about, about that particular process? Um, the second one has to do with this, this lack of enforcement in southern port cities, right? At times, it seems like enforcement goes up, and at other times, enforcement of these laws against 
um, you know, working without a pass or being a free black sailor or, or um, accusations and actually convictions for abetting slave escape. There are times when these enforcements go up and then there's times when they go down. And for the life of me, I cannot explain exactly what is making that happen. And I don't know if we, perhaps this is where I think people that are really zoomed into local histories can help us answer questions. Do we know exactly why that's the case? What makes enforcement peak? And simultaneously, what makes enforcement go back down? I think that's a really important question to, to consider. Uh, and then the last one in terms of sources, um, anything that you could tell us about recapturing uh, in, the, in the Freedom of the Do, um, Freedom on the Move database, I think would be really, really helpful. Um, thank you very much for inviting me. This has been uh, fantastic. I hope I didn't take too terribly long. Um, and I look forward to hearing your questions and, and hearing the responses. Thank you. Great, Michael, thank you so much. And thank you to the other three speakers. This was super. Um, we don't have a lot of time for questions, but I would like to take a couple from the audience if, if we have them. Um, so I have a question down here and then one in the back that way and one over there. Okay, fine. I want to be fair. Yeah. Fair enough. Hi, hello, can you hear me? Yes. I'm Diane Heller. I'm making a film about Edward Bannister, who was a well-known painter and I feel also sailed for the Underground Railroad. So my question is, because you might run into this, all of these ships coming and going from all of these ports, whether or not they had slaves stowed away, were they, um, was there some kind of log that a ship had to check in with a harbor master? Is there, and do you use those? And how do you access them? I've been dying to ask that, okay. You can take any mic, just tap it once. Yeah, go ahead, whoever would like to address that. I'll, I'll dive in really quickly. I, Virginia had the inspection records, uh, but it was late in the game, so to speak. It wasn't initiated until 1856. Um, and in that, they actually will tell you what ships were inspected and whether there were people running the inspection who then got caught later on or simply escaped. So that suggests to you that there's some problems. And they also tell you if they found people uh, hidden aboard those ships, because the whole purpose uh, of the inspection station, which today is Fort Wool. So if you ever come to Hampton Roads, coming from the peninsula to Norfolk, you will see a little fort right in the middle of the harbor. That's Fort Wool. That was the inspection station. It was also called the Rip Raps. And that's where they would stop the ships. They would smoke them out. They would search them to see, especially if they were headed northward. This then raises that question about how many people escape going to Haiti or going other places because they didn't inspect a lot of those ships. So, so but these ships that were stopped, they were headed northward, and there, there were some, there's some important details found in those records. So we'll go to our second question back here. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. All right. This isn't so much as a question as an observation, but um, sorry for the math, but <laughs> I need it. Um, so I was saying this isn't so much a question as it is an observation. And when we talk about freedom seekers and um, uh, enslaved people, um, you know, running away. Uh, we talk about them as if they are unintelligent, um, uncivilized people, but I think it's important to add to these dialogues that these people, were, when they were taken from their land, they were intelligent, they were civilization builders, they had advanced systems, and um, that's really just something that I would like to see that incorporated into a little bit more of the conversations. Thank you for that. That's. We, you know, we strive as historians to, to do this and in our writing, and absolutely, no, I couldn't agree more with your observation, so thank you. Uh, gentlemen here, and then we'll come down to the front. Yes, hi, this is more of a, um, a suggestion. I know that in the Fairhaven paper, which, di which is digitized, um, like right now you're looking at uh, slave uh, runaway, excuse me, runaway advertisements. But often they'll have a, a one in the paper that um, they'll have a one sentence line about so and so is having his ship repaired, you know, and maybe 
um, uh, a simple sentence would appear in the newspaper saying, uh, police have apprehended a runaway slave and just like one sentence little story in the, in the digitized versions of newspapers. Um, it's just another way of trying to find the unsuccessful escapes um, and increase your workload tremendously at the same time to try to find all that information. Thank you. Great. Did, you, did anyone want to comment on that? Oh, or? That works. Okay, so just real quick then about the, like, well, we, in the Freedom on the Move project, we refer to them as committed advertisements, because um, they're often advertisements that are put forth by jailers um, that are advertising for the capture of runaway enslaved individuals in the hopes of getting the, their previous, you know, the people who claim ownership over them to come and gather them, because then they have to pay for their board and for the fees that are associated with being jailed. Um, so those are fairly frequent, um, but there are a lot of instances where those also don't appear because they were claimed in other ways, or if they're not claimed, there's also um, state or city auctions that happen afterwards as well. So there's a lot of instances where you can see where individuals were not necessarily successful, and they are more difficult to connect those dots because sometimes they say different names, they say different locations, um, they say different potential like enslavers. It's kind of a difficult thing to do, but it is possible. Okay. Um, I think in the interest of time, um, and I saw your hand, but um, maybe we can ask it another time. Uh, we're going to stop here. We were meant to stop this uh, panel at uh, 3.15, so we're going to take a break, and then we'll reconvene in about 10 minutes for our, our next panel. Thank you. <laughs>